This Twin Peaks Investing Podcast is brought to you in association with SharePad from ShareScoop, the UK's number one investment data and analysis software for private investors and traders. Visit sharescope.co.uk and discover the advantage. Hello and welcome to this Twin Peaks Investing Podcast. This is podcast number 124. My name is Peter Higgins. You can find me at Compass3 on Twitter. And I'm here with Henry Viola Hare at HT Viola on Twitter. And I've got Phil Oakley um, as my two co-hosts on this particular um, episode. Um, thank you all for your fantastic feedback that we had for podcast 123, for our absolute investing gem, um, of an individual with Algie Hall of City Wire. I've seen loads of tweets of you all discussing how we can go about actually implementing um, elite companies, which Phil obviously has a part of as well with City Wire. And um, we're going to be talking today mainly about some other stocks, which are not elite companies, but we really appreciate the feedback you gave us for that particular podcast and the encouraging numbers we saw for that particular pod. I've got some fantastic news for you to share with you, ladies and gents. Um, on this particular podcast with regards to the competition and the investing challenge, which we've not mentioned for a little while. Um, Henry's going to have um, some shout out, some names regarding the winners of, I think probably January and February, maybe even March as well. And we're going to tell you about the prizes as well that we're, we're going to be sharing with you, ladies and gents, for, for being the best stock pickers um, on this particular competition that we've got. Uh, but firstly, I'm going to rip, Quickly, just tell you about the markets. I'm going to ask Phil a particular question, followed by Henry. Just going to throw them under the bus with a random question, um, as as we do. Because I could see Henry getting nervous already. He's like, whoa, whoa, I'm not prepared for this. Right. So we had two bank holidays over Easter. We had Good Friday and Good Monday. Markets were closed. We opened on Tuesday. Everyone was rejoicing. The FTSE intraday went above 8,000. And everyone was singing and dancing. Um, intraday, the FTSE 100, it's 8,015. And then the market went, uh-oh, something's happening in America. We're not quite sure what's going on. And the uh, trading data was saying that a couple of shares were going to be having a pretty poor day on, um, on Tuesday. So the markets gave up some of that movement in early trading and the FTSE and AIM. And then obviously it came out. Tesla, poor data, market's not happy with it. First negative sort of trading update for for a num for number of number of quarters. Today the markets went even further and declined even further from their highs. And intraday, the FTSE 100 at 7,882. So you're looking at 140 points ish from what less than 12 hours of trading. Right. And and that's how fast it can move when sentiment's good. Great. Markets move and they, they charge off. And when it's not, it it runs, runs away with itself. So today we've eked out a little bit of movement on the um, on the shares of the FTSE 100. And we finished at seven thousand nine hundred thirty seven yesterday and a little bit today. The miners have been helping us out a little bit um, regarding the, the stock market. But everything was going up yesterday. Um, AIM. What's the aim all share was it seven thousand seven sorry seven seven four seven forty two down just a tiny little bit today but it's still sitting above um the the magic seven hundred which is everybody everybody wants but more, again more and more little companies are delisting or giving up the ghost um so we need to watch that for numbers um regarding stuff and uh, footsie aim all footsie all share is sitting nicely above four thousand still at 4,326, so all is good. Um, but we've got to keep an eye on the S&P 500, NASDAQ, and the Dow, because if and when that declines, we'll decline too. Hopefully, as we get the new ISA money coming in within the next few days and next week and the month and so on and so forth of April and May, we will sit nicely above that um, magic marker of 8,000 unless we get some negative, negative news or sentiment so i wanted to ask you phil and then henry this net the, the talk last pod the podcast before last was about the brit isa 
And everyone was talking about that. We now know it's not going to happen this year. We now know it's probably going to be next year if it happens at all. The conversation that's been had today in the market and the past week or so is this thing about stamp duty, yeah, on investing in stocks and shares. Does it make a difference? Is it something that would encourage people to invest more? Is it something that would enable corporates to actually spend more because there's more value in their shares, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So just, you know, without any sort of dress rehearsal, whatever, I just wanted to get, you know, Phil's take on stamp duty and then yours, Henry, as in, as investors, you know, I know Phil's majoritively in um, ETS at the moment and obviously they're not paying any stamp, uh, but I'm talking about stamp on shares and other entities where you've got to pay the stamp duty. Phil, any thoughts, mate? Um, well, yes, I think they should get rid of it. <clears throat> um, I, I I find it uh, I find it very hard to justify, um, and I do think um, <clears throat> I do think it puts people off. Um, it makes it makes the cost of dealing in shares uh, more expensive. Uh, you know. You go and buy an American share through a broker and you don't pay stamp duty. Um, I think scrapping stamp duty full stop on not just on the shares but on houses would be would be a good thing as well. Um it's um if you want to do something to improve the attractiveness of, of the UK stock market, that would be a very, a very easy first step. Okie dokie. Thank you for that. Any any thoughts to add to that, Henry? Because like, you're mainly in, in shares, aren't you? You don't really use ETFs that much as far as I'm aware. Exactly. Yeah, my, uh, I, I'm with Phil 100% on this one, Peter. So um, to me, a tax is there to disincentivize or discourage a certain type of behavior or activity. If you want someone to do less of something, you tax it. Uh, and you therefore penalise them for it, and therefore discourage their their willingness to participate in that oh. activity. If we want to encourage investment in UK shares, scrapping stamp duty, I'd agree with Phil. Great place to start. Um, it's only half a percent, but it is half a percent of all transactions. And if you think of how many transactions there are buying and selling UK shares, that's a significant volume of money that could be added to UK valuations. So. Um, yeah, as far as I'm concerned, I'd rather see it slapped on cigarettes or alcohol. Ooh, cigarettes maybe, mate. Steady on the alcohol, please. <laughs> Come on. Um, I say that as a, as a lover of Guinness. <laughs> yeah, and, and rum and, and other alcohols as well. Um, <laughs> uh, sorry, go on, Phil, you want to add? I, I think <clears throat> the other thing that, you know, for those of us who've got, have got long memories, um, you know, remember... 27 years ago when Gordon Brown first became uh, the Chancellor and um, <clears throat> essentially put a tax or removed a tax credit on dividend payments um, on, on, on UK shares. And I think that that has, um, has, been, has done a lot of damage over the years. And again, that's something that could be done to improve uh, improve the attractiveness of UK shares, get pension funds investing back in the in in the UK stock market. Uh, I'm not sure the will is there to do it, but um, yeah, that would be another thing you could do as well. Cool. I, I, I was I'm asking this because another conversation was being had today uh, with Marion Somerset Webb of Bloomberg, and I and I replied to Marion regarding the. The new modeling that's come via um oxera and the cps think tank and he's basically saying that scrapping um stamp duty on shares would increase long-run gdp by 0.2 percent to 0.7 percent which on the gdp scale i think is quite significant you know and it also said increased business investment by FTSE firms um would increase by plus 2.8 billion to 6.8 billion and the average person with a dc pension pot would increase by six thousand six thousand pounds so looks like a win-win all around for everybody and that's before you start doing what you want to do phil with a sense of scrapping the stamp duty on on property and housing you know what i mean which obviously increases the, the the cost of of buying any sort of property these days you know and with property prices tend to be going in one direction 
it makes it more and more, you know, or less less affordable for everybody to buy that first property. So, yeah, there you go. Well, thank you, gents, for that for that reply. I'm going to go to our um, competition guru now, um, to Henry. But firstly, I want to tell you about the prizes before Henry tells you who's won January and February. So I've been working behind the scenes, ladies and gents, to try and get us a few prizes this year um, for this particular competition. This is for the Twin Peaks Investing Challenge where you've all that have entered. Um, I think it's 140 odd, if anyone will tell me the correct numbers in a minute, uh, this year, chosen five stocks. We tried to make sure it was FTSE and AIM orientated this year to get people to focus on the quality and undervalued stocks that are in the UK. Um, and I've managed to secure us um, books from Harriman House and uh, 12 months subscription to Investors Chronicle, uh, monthly prizes from Harriman House and monthly prizes from ShareScope, Ionic, who are the sponsors of this particular show. So thank you, ShareScope and Harriman House and Investors Chronicle. And then we've got the overall winner who will get um, 15 books, uh, 12 month subscription from Investors Chronicle. And obviously the share scope subscription of 12 months also. So we'll see what we can do. If we get anything else, we will let you know. Any of the monthly prizes, we will let you know. I'm going to quickly run through these books that I've got um, and which you'll be able to choose from. So the winners that get announced today, please have a think about these books. And I'll try and put a, a thread together on X slash Twitter for you, ladies and gents, to have a look at. And the books are in no particular order. From Zero to Millionaire by Nicholas Baroub, The Secret Wealth Advantage by Akhil Patel, Pathfinders by J.L. Collins, The Anatomy of the Bear by Russell Napier, The Allocator's Edge by Phil Huber, Inspirational Investing by Amanda Taylor, The Smart Money Method by Stephen Clapham, The Skeptical Investor by John Stepek, Just Keep Buying by Nick Majuli, The Investment Trust Handbook 20. 24 by Jonathan Davis. The Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel. Investing for Growth by Terry Smith. Investing Your Way to Financial Freedom by Robin Powell and Ben Carlson. And How to Pick Quality Shares by Phil Oakley. And also, of course, Algae Hall, Five Ways to Beat the Market. Those are the 15 books. I'm trying at the moment as well to negotiate with Aramon House to be able to get Morgan Housel's brand new book, uh, which is same as ever. But they've only got the rights to it in the UK. And we've got other listeners here that are overseas and they've not got the distribution for that particular book. So I'm trying to negotiate that if we do get a monthly winner that is UK based resident, they might be able to have access to that book the same as ever. But I haven't got that permission yet but just keep that in the background as a possibility as well um and then it's one or the other that you'll get a choice of those two so it still remains 15 books you won't get 16 books oh there you go henry i've covered the books Happy you're going to bring us up to speed lots of people are going what happened to january's winner what happened to february's winner henry's been sitting there for the past three months ladies and gents with an abacus to get the numbers ready so apologies. Here, over to you, Henry. Go and for it, sir. And don't forget to text Peter. One, Henry. Don't go straight to the winner, mate. Create a bit of suspense. You know what I mean? Oh. There's, there's going to be lots of suspense because I'm doing this with some uh, some rooms in a little bowl. Forget the abacus. <laughs> <laughs> bowl and bingo. <laughs> exactly. So, um, yeah, uh, for those of you that... Um, that, uh, that have entered. We've had 141 entrants uh, this year. Uh, we've all picked five shares listed on the UK market. Uh, and every month I run a little calculation to see how that portfolio of five shares has performed over the preceding four weeks. At the end of the month, we declare a winner. And that winner is the person whose portfolio has gone up the most over the preceding four weeks. We then reset the clock and I do the same activity for February, March, April, May and so on. So we'll have 12 winners throughout the year. And at the end of the year, the person whose portfolio has gone up the most will win the big bumper prize. So in reverse order for January, 
we had one James One and One on Twitter, whose portfolio went up a very creditable 15.7% for the month. In second place, we had at DJC 37986880, whose portfolio went up 84.6%. What? And in first place, oh yes, in first place, beating at DJC by just a hair's breadth, we had at Tiger Want, that's at Tiger Want, whose portfolio went up 85.5%. For those of you that are curious, the uh, the outlier in that portfolio was a little company called Helium One, ticket is HE1, whose uh, share price absolutely skyrocketed in January. Very well Amazing. done. If you write in to Peter um, at Tiger Want, we'll get the, uh, the prize arranged. In February... Wow. In third place, we had at Doreen0551, who gained 10% for the month. In second place, we had at Riz29LSE, whose portfolio went up 11.2%. And in first place, I'm very pleased to announce our friend Patchy at Patcat68, whose portfolio went up a fantastic 26.9% for the month. Very well done there, Pat. Again, do write in and we'll get your prize arranged. Well done, also Tiger Walton, to say, Pat Cat 68 cool. Very well done. Good numbers there. Also pleased to say we've also got March's numbers as we're now at the beginning of April. I've just run these, so they're fresh off the press. Uh, again, absolutely outstanding results from these portfolios here these are not returns that i see on a regular basis certainly uh, but it goes to show what you can do with a highly concentrated portfolio um and also the peace of mind of not having real money in it <laughs> in third yes, place helps. we've got at richard sutton i think this is uh at r c h r d s u t 76 whose portfolio went up 22.7% for the month. In second place, we had at Gallon 73, 28.5% for the month. And in first place, beating at Gallon 73 by 0.1 of a percent, we had wow. at Mike 24775926. These are some fantastic handles, by the way. <laughs> That's at Mike 24775926, whose portfolio went up 28.6% for the month. Very well done, Mike. Again, if you write in, we will get those prizes arranged. Thank you very much. Well done, Mike, with that one. What were the stocks in Mike's portfolio, Henry? Have you got them in front of you? Just a couple of the tickers, please. Yeah, so um, Avacta, AVCT, uh, Insig AI, INSG. Um, I think the next one is Zephyr something or other, ZPHR. Yeah, Zephyr, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, Skincare Biotherapeutics, uh, SBTX, uh, and yeah. WTB, which isn't one I recognise. WTB, that will be, that will be Whitbread, will it? That I'm not sure that what WTB? that one is. Off the top of my head, I've got Whitbread on the top of my head there, mate. I can't think of anything it else. It could well be Whitbread. Let me just yeah, have a quick Whitbread, look. On yeah, share, Whitbread. Pad. So he's gone it for some Whitbread. really tiddly ones, and then he's gone for a for a for a for a blue chip to just wait exactly. it up. Exactly. Yeah. Clever. Clever. Well, well done, Mike. Well done to our winners, um, Tiger One, Pat Cat sixty eight, and Mike. Um, well done. And um, give me a shout or stick get into my DM or whatever, um, and we'll sort out the prizes. Have a think about which books you want for the, the month. And I'll also have to get your email addresses so I can get um, ShareScope to contact you for your monthly subscription to ShareScope and trial if you don't already have it. And if you have already got ShareScope, which hopefully you have by now, um, we can sort out an extension to whatever sort of subscription you've got uh, from the team. And also try and get you, if you haven't started with ShareScope yet, um, to have a tutorial uh, a one-to-one -one tutorial um, for an hour or so or whatever time frame they give you so you can learn all the different um, tools and solutions that 
fill in the team have actually embedded to make things easier for you guys to select your stocks uh, because Phil has been the brains behind a lot of the stuff that they've done, although he doesn't like to talk. Isn't that right, Phil? <laughs> <laughs> Some of them. Henry, thank you ever so much for doing those numbers, mate. Absolutely brilliant. I'm really pleased that we've got up to March. We can sit and chill and relax and let people enjoy their books and their prizes and subscriptions to ShareScope now. And apologies for the delay. It's been a bit, we've been busy doing lots and lots of things, but congratulations to our three winners and well done to our um, individuals that have come um, third and second as well with the, some significant numbers there. I am blown away uh, with, with January's, um, opening the gate and people sprinting out with 85% for a month um, and Helium 1. I, I've seen the share price since then. Obviously, it's given some of that back, um, you know, a significant amount of that back, but what a what a, what a way to start the year um, for those people. Um, congrats. Um, next month, we'll also have a look at who's winning the overall competition um, for uh, the end of April, because that'll be end of the the, the first third of the the year um so yeah so that should be very very interesting indeed but thank you for that henry thank you ever so much sir my pleasure just sorting that out you're a star this is a quick hello to you our valued twin peaks investing podcast listener whatever channel you're listening to please make sure to subscribe and you'll always be the first to get the new episodes thank you for your continued support right phil um, we need you to talk about a stock, mate, that's going to go up 85% in the next month. Have you got one? What have you got? Well, I don't know about that. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about a stock. Hey, a joke. I'm, I'm going to talk about a stock that's actually already gone up a lot. And, um, right, okay. Maybe uh, maybe uh, quite a few listeners uh, own this stock or have, have had it brought to their attention already. Uh the stock is McBride. Mm -hmm. uh, ticker is MC Beef Bertie. And this is um, Europe's biggest uh, manufacturer of private label uh, household, household uh, products. So things like uh, dishwasher tablets, uh, Laundry tablets, washing powder, washing up liquid, <clears throat> you name it. Anything that's sort of used in, in the home. Uh, aerosols is another one that they make, air fresheners. And um, this is a company that's been an absolute basket case over the years. Um, primarily because it's been dealing with very powerful customers in terms of the major supermarkets. And... Anytime it gets into an issue with um, cost inflation, particularly things like plastic, which are like driven by the, the oil price, um, it has to wait. It's had to wait quite a long time to be able to get recover its costs. Um, but I think there's a step change going on within um, private label goods generally. I think more and more consumers are buying them. Um, What's been a slow burn over the years where a large number of people have gone into their supermarket and bought supermarket own label washing powder or <clears throat> fabric softener or what have you. Um, that's definitely accelerated with, uh, you know, as, as the cost of living uh, has, has gone up. It's a, it's a good way to save money. And McBride is doing very well out of it. Um, it is growing faster than the market, and it's mainly involved in uh, markets like the UK, France, Germany, Spain, Italy. Uh, it has a small business out in the Far East at the moment. And this trend, I think, is um, is likely to continue. Um, but what I think is very positive is that they seem to have an improved relationship um, with the major supermarkets. And the supermarkets love... Uh, private label because they can make more money from them. They can make more margin from them uh, than selling selling brands. And the brands are very much on the back foot at the moment. I mean, you only have to walk around the supermarket and see how aggressive brands now are being in terms of their of their promotions. And they're trying to get a bit of share back from, uh, from private label. 
but a lot of this private label growth is sticking. So the relationship is better. They can recover cost better. And there is some, there is some volume growth here. Um, you combine that with um, the ability to keep on not only taking market share, but also to gain more sales with certain customers like hard discounters, which they don't have as much of as they'd like. And you can construct a decent, modest sort of revenue, nothing, you know, nothing shooting the lights out, but a decent case here for continued revenue growth, but also improving margin. Companies becoming more efficient, it's generating cash, it's paying down debt. Um, forecast momentum in this business is incredibly strong. Um, back end of February, there was a, an upgrade um, to full year forecasts. And um, the shares are actually up 255%, okay, over the last year. And that makes you think, I've missed this. Um, well, yeah, you have missed a lot of it. But the good news is that these shares are only on five times earnings. And, you know, could these shares go to eight times earnings? Yes, quite, quite possibly. And with earnings momentum, I think these shares have um, potentially still got quite a long way to run. I think it's a, a better company than it, than it has, has historically been, and it's keeping on getting better. Not the greatest business in the world, but but one that's on offer at a at still a very attractive price with a lot of good good things happening to it. Thank you for that, Phil. I think it's interesting because we, we spoke about... Um... I think it was you who spoke about it actually. Wreck it in the in the last pod, wasn't it? Yeah. With um, with algae on on board here, and it was showing basically that Wreck it's really struggling, um, and potentially it's got some long term issues there sitting there waiting to to kick off possibly, and their revenue streams and profitability has been declining, and you're talking now about McBride's accelerating. It's it's been looked at. In complete opposite so it's almost like a, a paradox we're having here now where the gleaming star was wreck it if not unilever and and the pup um or the donkey was matt bride and everybody was like kicking it to the curb and not interested in it because it it, had, it couldn't get it out of its own way and it's just the tables have completely turned now and the profitability is increasing at matt bride the the um the growth is accelerating uh, etc the, the cutting down the debt still see the debt there i've just pulled the numbers up here one last numbers were 1446 million which sounds quite chunky when you think about it for a company that's generating this the size of revenues each year that they're doing but it's positive momentum it's got right now whereas before nobody wanted it um so yeah i think it's one of those interesting stocks phil I, I'm obviously minded that already it's gone up 256%. And like you say, I, I'm probably going to be thinking, mm, you know, but it's one of them stocks, I think, potentially where people have ignored it and gone, yeah, but it's Matt Bride, it won't last. And it then carries on. And then it carries on some more. And now it's sitting at, what is it, a pound odd? Yeah? Uh, just, a, just around a pound, yeah. Yeah, so you've got other people coming out, putting analysis on it now, saying it could actually go above 110, 115, and so on and so forth. And if the next set of numbers come out again, or price stays where it is, their profit margins increase, it will do another upgrade. You know, so yeah, yeah, I like I like that. And I like the fact it's a small, it is, it's what we class as a small cap. So yeah, it's got time to to grow. And who who knows? Some cheeky bugger might decide actually we don't want them having all the margins for themselves and we'll just bolt them onto ours and then take it in house. But who knows? It's always a possibility. Small caps tend to be takeover targets, don't they, Phil? Yeah, they're a lot easier to buy, obviously, because of their size. Whether they would buy it, uh, someone would come and buy it, I, I don't know. Okie dokie. Henry, any thoughts, mate? Any, any I love um, it. own brands? You buy yeah, I mean, I, that's a business to me. I've never looked at it before. I've just pulled the figures up on SharePad. Uh, I'm gobsmacked that's not doing a lot better than it is. I mean, in terms of price momentum, certainly, but historically, you're right, it's been a dog of a company, and I don't see how or why. It's such a basic business model. You produce a basic good, fairy liquid, 
you rip the label off so it's just washing up liquid and you stick a Sainsbury's logo on it and now it's Sainsbury's <laughs> washing up liquid. Yeah, how on earth can you lose money doing this? I don't understand. To me, this is a super attractive business model. And with all the cost of living pressures we've got on the go at the moment, I would think that this has got a lot of potential to it. So really interesting name. Um, and like you say, on a PE of five, I think you said. Just over. To me, yeah. that, that's that got some some really interesting potential for uh, an upgrade if they can yeah, sort they, out this they... profitability issue. Yeah, they'd always been squeezed, hadn't they, Phil, by the big big boys and yeah. oh, and at the beck and call us to oh, we want this, we want that, we want this now. And then also the issue of sometimes with these sort of companies, they don't always get paid on time in a timely right. manner, as well with the big boys, Tesco's, you know, et al, Sainsbury's et al. Just say, like, yeah, Menyana, Menyana, we'll pay you soon. And they've got their their own costs, you know, and electricity costs, energy costs, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, plastic costs. Um, we're always they're always What's the fa your favourite word, Phil? Very cyclical, regarding the nature of of the markets, just beating them up, beating them above the head um, every single sort of quarter. But they seem to be getting their their house in order. I wanted to ask you, Phil, did they change CEO or CFO, or has anything happened on that sort of front structurally? I must what's admit, been, I have... what's been, what do you what do you think has been the catalyst in the past year for the for things to shake things up? Is it the cost of living crisis and people just you know moving down? I think it's lots of things. I think it's, I think it's that. I think it's you know management changing the way the business is done. I also detect um, a change in a change in approach from the big supermarkets. Um, I think one of the reasons why the discounters Aldi and Lidl have been so successful is that they have uh, embraced private label. To a, to a lot larger extent than the main supermarkets have. And they've done it by working in partnership with private label rather than a sort of, you know, a cost to be beaten down in a spreadsheet type type approach. And you see it with other businesses as well. I mean, Greencore, which is a company that uh, makes, makes a lot of sandwiches for a lot of the supermarkets, yeah. um, I, that's another company that's benefiting from, I think, from this this change of approach. Um, so it's those those kind of things really that uh, that are making making the company more attractive than perhaps it used to be. Indeed, and Greencore's had a good run. I mentioned Baco um, a little while back, and we've talked about the profitability of those two. I spoke to um, with James one James about that. And um, I, I, and I took on board that Greencore is a better quality business, and actually that's share price has done much better than than Backor um, in recent months. So yeah, and Green Greencore is, is probably going to be quite good going forward, as as well as more people going back to work and back into their offices. Um, so that should help matters somewhat. Right, yeah. I'm going to talk about a company now, and then we'll go to Henry that I wanted to talk about in the last podcast, and since then. They come out with their full year numbers. So I'm going to go back to the backstory as to what I had prior to this um, full year numbers coming out on the 27th, and then I was going on holiday um, because I couldn't speak about it because we didn't have enough time with Algae. Um, wanted to focus on Algae talking about elite companies, but this company um, in the past 12 months, its shares are up already 180 percent, and the company's name is Winwood Limited. The ticker is W N. W D. And for me, um, it's a very, very interesting company. So 25% year to date. It's a small cap, or tiddler, should I say, uh, market cap sub 100 million at 97.5 million. Uh, shares outstanding 88.65 million. The last 12 months, its share price range is 33 pence to 125. Um, and Winwood is an and this is politically sensitive, I know, at the moment regarding what's going on all over the place, is an Israeli-based company that operates in a predictive maritime analytics. The company's predictive intelligence combines artificial intelligence, which attracts me, AI, and big data to empower global maritime industry with a 360-degree um, risk management solution to enable customers and partners to understand that the marine ecosystem and its broader impact on safety, finance, and business. Um, essentially, you've got 
solutions, trading and shipping, um, maritime AI, and operational efficiency, risk management. These are solutions that it provides. And it's got loads of blue chip clients, Interpol, London Stock Exchange, um, NATO, you name it. It's got all these blue chip clients. And that I'm thinking, wow. And came out with a, a bullish RNS, which I noted in January, um, basically saying, following good trading throughout the year at a strong finish, board is pleased to report that he expects full year results to be comfortably ahead of market forecast. That was in January. And obviously it carried on since then. And then in February, it was chosen by Interpol. Um, what is Interpol? If you don't know, it's the world's largest international police organization. So that tells you that the caliber of their kit um, must be pretty darn good. And then um, 27th of February, Windward expanded its partnership with the London Stock Exchange Group. Again, you're thinking, what have these guys got under the bonnet that attracts those sort of agencies to want to work with them? Um, so, yeah. So we get to 27th of March and it comes out and it's basically saying we're sitting here and we've had strong financial results and record customer wins along further market leading innovations and financial highlights, annual contract value up 35% to 35, 34,000 and 0.5 million dollars versus in 2022 25.5 and revenue was up 31 percent to 28,000.3 million dollars gross margins were up 700 basis points from 79 percent sorry to 79 percent from 72 percent and essentially it reduced its reduced its losses from minus 12 million to Five million, and it goes on. It got cash and cash equivalents of seventeen point three million uh, versus twenty two in December twenty twenty two. So the cash burn is not too great, going down uh, five million. I think the interesting thing about this one here for me is the momentum and the confident outlook, as well, and the fact that it's now saying it's on the cusp of getting to break even this year, which means that next year we're going to be hitting profitability. And the CEO speaks very confidently. And I know we should always take these sort of things with a pinch of salt, but I'll read you what he, what, um, he said here. Amy Daniel, CEO and co-founder of Winwood, said, I'm pleased to have given another year of significant progress for Winwood in line with our status strategy, delivering record levels of ACV and revenue, including substantial growth in our commercial segment, global trade faces an array of evolving challenges across security sanctions and supply chains. In the face of these ongoing pressures, we have further cemented our position across the industry as a trusted partner to governments and businesses of all sizes to help them meet their ambitions. Looking ahead, we are excited to scale the business further and meet the growing need for digitization in the maritime market. We are supported in these ambitions by our global and committed team of maritime experts, strong cash position, enabling continued investment into our solutions and people and high levels of recurring revenue. Then you get um, Panmure Gordon coming out saying, basically, we're going to raise our um, price target for the group from 129 to 147. And bearing in mind that Winwood currently today is sitting at 105. Uh, this is a company that um, IPO'd um, Two, two, nearly three years ago now, and it's sitting below where it IPO'd. So I'm thinking here's a chance for this company to actually um, move on. Um, IPO December 2021 at 155, had a bit of a, you know, as IPOs do, people IPO in it because they want to get out at 155. Share price, as I said, um, last 52 week low was 33. So you can see from the IPO, the people that were in there went, I'm, I'm out of here. Bailed at one at, from 155, eventually bailed at 33 pence. That was the bottom in the last 52 weeks. And now it's accelerated. It's gone up 180%. And um, still loss-making. I know Henry hates loss-making companies. Um, but revenue has been growing, growing at an annualized rate of 22% for the last five years. In comparison, and not, not necessarily a full comparison to another company that's 
a little bit smaller in that space. Bremer PLC, uh, market cap of 85 million versus Winwood's 95 million is profitable, but its revenues have been declining on an annual rate of 0.5% for the last eight years. So you've got a loss making company worth 95 million and a profitable company at 85 million. One's decelerating, one's accelerating. I'm choosing the one that's accelerating with a bit of AI engine to, to keep it going uh, within with relationships with blue chip clients like Interpol and United Nations and London Stock Exchange. Winwood, ticker symbol WNWD is my stock. I don't own it yet. I'm hoping it comes down a little bit further and I'll be um, potentially jumping on board at sub one pound. There you go, boys. Another AI stock that no one's talking about. I know Phil's going to hate this because it's lost me. So I'll go to you, Henry. Be nice. What are you going to say about it, Henry? Phil, I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh sorry, dear. Peter. All right. No. Oh, dear. Two punches to the chin. All right, go on. You so, go first, Henry. Um, I love the sales pitch, by the way. Like, if they've not got an IR department, they should totally give you a call. Like, his name's Peter Higgins, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sure he's available for the right price. But, um, you know, I, 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 I love the focus on the blue chip clients and i totally get what you're saying if the lse is sniffing around great the thing is their revenue is tiny you know how much does the lse spend on it a year tens of millions hundreds of millions yeah, i don't yeah. know you know and what are they spending with winwood a couple of million a year it's a rounding error to them so to winwood it seems it seems significant and you know substantial to the lse some director's seen some shiny thing and gone, oh, yeah, give him a try. If it doesn't work out, we've lost nothing. I'm hurting here, Henry. Are you going to say anything nice about it? Well, um, <laughs> just say no. The, the, I will move to the third. caveat. The caveat to all of this, to my enormous bearishness, um, the caveat to all of this is that you have picked up on something with the profitability. Now, that does pique my interest because you're right. That should be an inflection point for the share price and the company. And the share price is already responding to positive news. Momentum is building. Somebody is acquiring these shares. Now, oh, yeah. if the company becomes profitable, the share price is going to, you know, pop. And in theory, once you've started that journey, if revenue continues and your profit margins continue to expand because you've already developed the software, your margins start to expand and therefore the revenue starts to grow, your earnings per share start to grow, and that drives shareholder returns. So it could well be if that trend keeps up, you know, you might have found something that's a multi-bagger here. I don't know. I'm not saying it is, but mm. that to my mind is how you get these multi-bagger scenarios. You buy them when they're cheap and loss making, you wait for them to take off on a positive trajectory when they take off on the positive tra trajectory, the market responds and therefore the shares multibag. What you probably don't want to do is wait until they've already become profitable and that profit is already baked in and the growth rate is already baked in. And therefore, you're probably not going to get that multibag buying it later. Indeed. I mean, I wish I picked it up and, and looked at it earlier, Henry, last year when it was at 30, 33, 35, 50 pence. And saw it, you know, um, but I didn't. Um, I don't own it yet. It's still loss making. It's got some cash. The revenues are small, um, but I'm looking at it and thinking, hmm, let's wait and see. And can can the revenues accelerate? Can will bigger companies come in and, and take bigger contracts with them as they actually stabilize? The big caveat for me at the moment is the noise around anything with the with the word Israel in it, um, given what's going on on the political. Um, and war fronts and um, geopolitical fronts, should I say. And that does not help matters at this present time. But given I was going to talk about it in the last pod, I just wanted to, to put the, the, the company's name out there and the potential. And when things, you know, hopefully we'll get some peace over there at some point, um, we'll see what happens. OK, I'm already battered and bruised, Phil. So just crack on, mate, and tell me, give me just hit me where it hurts. Oh no no! I mean, I mean, for me, I'd have to like spend a bit of time getting my head around what the company actually does, and uh, what what the uh, what the customer actually gets from it. 
But by the by, I think the thing that interests me, I'm just looking at the forecasts uh, on Sharepad here. Um, <clears throat> one of the things I look for in a company is uh, something that's called the drop-through rate. So this is, you look at the extra revenue that it adds and see how much extra profit comes from it. Now, if I look at the forecasts, sort of between 2024, 2026, uh, about 15 million of extra profit, sorry, of extra revenue coming through. And then there is about, it's going from a loss of 2 million trading profit, trading loss of 2 million to a trading profit, 5 million. So there's 50 million of extra sales producing 7 million of extra profit. So what's that? A 40 odd percent drop through rate. That's quite mm. impressive. That's quite impressive uh, and tells you that, you know, this is a, you know, a very profitable business once it's once it's achieved a, a certain scale of scale of revenue. So that, that's my that's my two pennies on that. Okay, dokie. Well, I'll, I'll take that and and thank you, Henry, for the for the objectivity on it. I think it's essentially it is one of those stocks which you know some institutions were buying and and um, were wedded were temporarily wedded to the locking period came and went and they sold you know having you know IPO'd it at one fifty five for for it to go from one fifty five um, down to thirty three p over the course of under under three years. Um, I just wish I'd been more alert to what was going on with it. Um, sub 50p, I would already be holding that particular stock, I think, and waiting for it, as you say, Henry, to, to get to profitability and back above. Because that's the other thing. These, those institutions that didn't get in, I see are watching it now, I think. And what if it goes back above one, the IPO price and then becomes pro and, and profitable or whatever um, order it comes in, people can start looking at it. And, you know, also... Once it goes above the 100 million market cap, there's other institutions can buy it at that stage. 200 million market cap, again, more institutions can buy it at that stage as well. So we'll see what happens with it going forward. Okie dokie. Phil, we are... I've, Henry, do you want to go to your... Sorry, we'll go to your stock, mate, now, shall we? Yeah, absolutely. I've, I've just yeah. got the one this week. Um, go for it. It is a UK company, a £1.2 billion market cap IT consultancy, which provides digital services and workday implementation. If you can't guess what it's called, the company is Kanos Group. The ticker is K-N-O-S. Now, the company provides uh, effectively professional services consultancy to develop IT functions within different businesses. So they help companies to identify issues and then develop and implement IT-based solutions to those issues. They help to envisage, plan, prove, and execute IT-based transformation projects. In addition to this, they also implement something called Workday, which if you don't work in a large corporate entity or you haven't previously, Workday is a little bit like a business operating system is how I describe it. Effectively, the company throws all of its financial and workload requirements into this big database. And the database then allows the business to analyze that financial and workload information and create operating decisions based on financial and human capital management. So effectively, how much money have you got? How much work do you need to do? How many people have you got to do that work? And how do you mesh those three things together to manage your organization most efficiently. Workday is used by companies to deliver everything from employee engagement surveys, so finding out how happy your staff are, to workload management, seeing how efficient and effective your employees are, um, to managing spend planning and financial analysis across the business, so helping companies to make capital spend decisions on a large scale. The business has got um, a really solid return on capital of about 40%, uh, as most professional services and software companies do. It, it's not particularly capital intensive. Uh, it pays a nice 2.5% dividend yield, which is 1.8 times covered. Um, and most interestingly to me, it's forecast to grow revenues at about 10% a year out to 2026, 
uh, and also to grow earnings per share at about 12% a year out to 2026. So this is a business that is, you know, really doing very well for itself. It's net cash, so it's got a strong balance sheet. So for those of you out there that are worried about interest rates impacting debt maturity, um, you don't have to worry about that. Uh, and interestingly, price performance has been really, really weak the last couple of years. Even year to date, it's down 12%. And yet revenue and profits are going in the right direction. So I think this is a company that the market has got absolutely wrong. Um, I think it's a really great opportunity to buy a really great business. And I honestly think that if it carries on uh, declining in share price value, that someone like Accenture could very easily come over the pond and snaffle them up in a private takeover. So I think that's one listeners might want to go and do a little bit of research on. Whether you are an experienced or new investor, you know how valuable it is to conduct portfolio enhancing analysis and to have easy access to data that will give you the edge. As a Twin Peaks investing podcast listener, you can access an exceptional offer via SharePad from ShareScope, the UK's number one investment data and analysis software for private investors and traders. This special Twin Peaks offer is available to new subscribers only, and you can subscribe using the promo code Twin Peaks. The incredible and exclusive offer means that monthly subscribers will get their second month free and annual subscribers will get their 13th month free. Sign up and subscribe to SharePad today using the Twin Peaks promo code and you can save up to £69. Visit sharescope.co.uk forward slash sharepad for further details and subscribe to the investing and trading analysis and data you need. Okie dokie. Yeah, it's another tech one. And our tech stocks are so un- unloved and it continues and it persists. Um, and I'm not sure what what the, some companies have got to do really to get the attention of um, of, of investors and in, in institutions. Uh, Phil, your first thoughts about Kanos? Is it one that you've looked at before? Any thoughts uh, about gonna, it? Uh, not, not from memory. I don't think I've ever looked at this. Um, you know, it has has a lot of characteristics of, of, of software companies in terms of, you know, very profitable, uh, very cash generative. My my sort of concern about this is that, you know, whilst whilst you know the, the, there's growth there, which is which is always nice to see. The um, the forecast momentum in this business over the last 12, 15 months has actually been coming down. Uh, analysts have been moving their forecast down, um, not not by a lot, but even so, there's, you know, if the one thing that, you know, you, I've learned a lot over the years is that you can talk until you're blue in the face about fundamentals and how great a business is. Essentially, the stock market likes momentum. It likes, it likes, it likes stories that get, that get better and outlooks that get better. And it seems that what's, uh, what's holding this company back at the moment is that the outlook hasn't been getting better. In fact, it's been moving down um, ever so slightly over the last sort of 15 months. Uh, and that, that's something I think you need to have a look into before you before you pull the trigger on this. Um, there may be, you know, perfectly valid reasons for it, but I, I would look into that because that's usually a sign that it's not not usually a great sign. You want to see you want to see forecasts holding up and arguably moving up. Um, and you're not seeing that with this one. Very valid. Yeah, I'm, very I'm, valid. I have to agree with you there. I, I like my tech stocks, but like you say, it's a tech stocks so a, a reasonable PE, and the PE doesn't match the the revenue and profitability growth pace percentage returns etc cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but is that their fault? Is it what is it because of delays in contracts, et cetera, et cetera? I, I don't know. But as with all these things, you know, it's a reasonably sized company. And unfortunately, if they don't sort themselves out, a larger institution, like you mentioned, Henry, um, Accenture or otherwise, are going to go, yeah, OK, let's put this one to bed and um, let's take it out of business. And we'll, and we'll lose another um, UK listed company um, from an overseas predator. Um, and they'll then, you know, make it more efficient 
and make it um, <clears throat> part of their their own um, internal growth rather than you know as an independent. So yeah, good company. And I know that lots of the tech guys, including our good friend George O'Connor, um, he likes um, Kanos and other tech stocks like this. And um, let's hope that that they can actually turn it around and accelerate the growth. It's definitely one to keep an eye on. And at some point or other, Henry, it will become one of those stocks which sorts itself out and I think would then go and we'll see it just moving. And, and no one will be looking at it because people get distracted by what's going up and the stuff that's going down, they're, they're no longer looking at it. And right now it's sitting there, isn't it? You know, waiting for the next catalyst. What's it going to be? And if that catalyst arrives, it'll be it'll be off to the races. So yeah, good stock. I like it. Um, I have looked at it before, um, and it's one of them that I I definitely keep an eye on. So thank you for that, sir. Right, um, Phil, you were talking about forecast momentum and revenue momentum, and um, the stock I've got and I'm talking about here hasn't got either of those. <laughs> <laughs> Mine hasn't so it, it, it is a former covid darling it is a dog it is a donkey um it was trading over it's a u.s stock sorry i'll tell you the name folks before we get going it's called Un U unity software inc and the ticker is just you dollar you and it is a former covid darling it's um shares are trading at over 200 dollars a piece uh, back in 2020, 2021. And now we're sitting at 25. Last time I looked, it was 25.78. Um, and it's got a market cap now of 10 billion, just shy of 10 billion. So what was it at 200, nearer to 100, you know, 80, 80, 80 to 100 billion market cap? Um, because everyone loves a, a software company. But this is a company that's got, been through the ringer over the last um, 18 months. And it's essentially going through a process of um, restructuring. Um, managed a, a pretty large merger, which they're still trying to put to bed at the moment. And essentially, it's restructured itself into a pure play software company. Um, and I'll give you the description of what it says here uh, about it all. Unity Software provides a platform for creating and growing interactive real-time 3D, as in for the for the techies out there, RT 3D content experiences. So everyone's talking about goggles now and HoloLenses and AR and VR. I see all these individuals sitting on trains doing that. <laughs> you know, you're thinking uh, <laughs> some of them are doing that without the um, the goggles on, by the way. But you know, that's that's by the by. Um, and it's 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 sets of software, including artificial intelligence solutions, um, supports creators through the entire development lifecycle to so they can build, run, grow augmented and virtual reality devices. A platform consists of two complementary sets of solutions: create solutions and grow solutions. Uh, create solutions are real both set set of tools. And developers use these tools and services across a range of industries, ranging from games to aerospace, construction to retail, medical to manufacturing, and others. And essentially, Grow Solutions offers customers the ability to engage their user base, to monetize their content from 2D uh, puzzle games to multiplayer, multi platform games, and other 3D interactive content. The additional bit that I like about this particular company, despite the restructuring, is that it's also got military applications and contracts already. Uh, but they've been slashing and burning the company, accelerating the the the, um, the restructuring. They, where are we now? I'm losing track of the time, dates. February, um, they sold off the digital twin professional services arm to Capgemini, um, their real-time 3D technology arm. They sold that to Capgemini. That's going to finish in the next half of, of the year um, and that I'm a little bit like concerned about because that was quite a, a big large revenue stream for them um, and the CEO is basically saying Unity had reached a point in its growth where the opportunity for us in the enterprise market had outpaced our ability to scale fast enough to meet client demand hence the reason they sold it I'm like mm, yeah so it came out in February as well in the Q4 and essentially released numbers which were very, very bad. 
uh, posted negative earnings per share of 66 cents versus what were expected of 22 cents positive earnings per share uh, versus what analysts expected. So it was a massive miss. So the shares got spanked um, back in February. And guidance now is way below uh, projections, which they had before, of 415 um, million dropped down to 450 million sorry um, from 536 billion so it's all negative 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 so why am i talking about this well they reduced the staff by 25 percent they're going to be um, essentially by the end of this year a uh, pure play software company you've got the likes of google meta as aws amazon um and everybody else nvidia talking about spatial computing what's that about everything to do with this everything to do with health tech where you can just see inwardly on ar and vr and mixed reality um if they can turn this this ship around then i think there's a possibility that this company has another as a rebirth they've got a new ceo um called jim whitehurst and he's ex ibm and I think if anybody can actually turn the ship around, it would possibly be him. And AR and VR is going to be, I don't, should I say it? I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it. Oh, I feel nervous saying it. The next AI. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I'm joking with you. But I see it as a possibility. They need to turn this around. XCO is gone. Um, that that reduced their their staff significantly, and uh, now it's a turnaround restructuring story. Can it can it turn it around? Will it take time? Yes. What happens if it turns around? Uh, this stock doubles once the turnaround um, is as accelerated. Um, so that's where I'm at with it. Is it a dog at the minute? Yes. Is it? Could it go to the vets and get put down? Yes. Um, but I like turnaround stories, and the military contracts are still in place. And um, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, we'll see. There you go, Phil. Phil's got his hand over his mouth like he doesn't want to don't want to puke. <laughs> oh, he's oh, he's laughing his head off. <laughs> Let's go to you, Phil. Get it out of the way, mate. Mock me all you want. But for those that are not on 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 YouTube, come across to see Phil's face now. He's just red no, with rage. I don't do How that. dare you bring that crap to this podcast? <laughs> yeah. Go on, Phil. Yeah, we had elite laughing, companies last week. What have we got this so week? so hard at one of my stocks, Bill. I think, you, uh, yeah, you, you've taken the words out of my mouth. Oh, dear. Uh, I, uh, no, definitely, I would not go anywhere near this. <laughs> it, it's uh, it's horrible. It looks horrible. It just, uh, I think of nothing, nothing to recommend this. It's, I've got uh, to say, Peter, I've got to pile in with Phil here. This looks sorry, like is, is, sorry, sorry. Wait, wait one, wait one, wait one. <laughs> is that all you're going to say about it, Phil? Well, you know, we don't want people to turn off. <laughs> <laughs> Over to you, Henry. Go on. <laughs> if we have still got anybody left, ladies and gentlemen, we aren't setting up a competitor to elite companies called terrible dogs of the market. <laughs> um no, I, 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 I honestly, I, I don't know. I don't know what you're thinking. This is definitely one where I'm scratching my head here with Peter, and occasionally he pulls these names out, and I go, "What?" I, I don't see it at all. I mean, to me, AR and VR, you've just got to look at Meta, ladies and gentlemen. Mark Zuckerberg stood up what three years ago and said, "We're going to create this multiverse thing. It's all about the goggles, right?" And he spent how many billions was it? with the brightest yeah. developers in the world and he managed to create animal farm from 1990 nobody wanted to use it nobody wanted to buy it and that was the that was the company that changed their name to do this <laughs> on the flip side you've then got unity software who are trying to do something similar and all i can see in my head oh, is on, mark zuckerberg's it's... floating <laughs> it's spatial computing. Listen, you're going to see more and more commentary about spatial computing going forward. That, that, okay. that for the, one I... For that... the engineers, for the military, yeah, looking in 
Anyway, even reading, Phil. Phil, you love your books. You'd be able to go like that in your goggles and read and read rather than looking on your Kindle. Anyway, it's a dog. I know it's a dog. Phil's flexing for more. For those who are not looking on on YouTube, Phil's flexing for for more uppercuts. Go on, Phil. I, I, this is this is a very dangerous space. Okay. Yeah. I think the meta. You, you know, Henry points out about meta. Meta is losing shed loads of money in its uh, in in this in this part of its business. Um, the whole thing about I, I just cannot buy into the uh, the sort of the view that people are going to be spending lots of time with goggles on their heads doing stuff. Um, I think there are, I mean, there are well-known sort of apparently problems with motion sickness wearing these things, I've been told. Where I do think it's interesting is the <clears throat> augmented reality, AR it's called, digital twins, which can get used by industrial companies Um you know, to create things like virtual factories and where they can test out new bits of kit or new production methods. My my view on that is just buy NVIDIA. Just buy NVIDIA is 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 a major player in this in this space in terms of uh, the chips. Um, you yeah. best to, off to, buy to, to add to what you're saying there, Phil. That, to me, interrupt you, mate. The, the the positive would have been if they'd kept the digital twin bits. They just sold that chunk off to Cap Gemini, which doesn't help matters either. Yeah, you're not you know, helping here. So it's a, another negative. I'm not helping matters. I'm just telling you what the reality of what's going on. So we're sitting at 10 billion now. A year from now, we'll have a conversation about it. It'll either be a five billion dollar company, <laughs> still a 10, or it'll be a 20. So let's see. Anyway, uh, I think dog you should. Dog. I, I think you should buy these shares, Pete. Put a, put a small bit of money in them and any profits donate donate it to a worthy cause because it, <laughs> yeah. you'll have you'll have you'll Ooh, have earned it. Top form tonight, ladies and gents. Honestly, kick a man while he's down. Right, Henry, <laughs> very very brief, briefly before we go to Phil with his last stock, um, tell us about the charity, mate. Center point. Yes. What's been happening? We have not a chance to mention it for a couple of weeks. So for those of you that have got pent up demand to make a donation to Centerpoint. Henry's going to bring you up to speed and tell you where to find the Just Giving page. Well, I'd just like to, I'd like to rewind the second before I dive straight into the, into the link, because um, the weather has started to improve. It is getting warmer. The nights are drawing out and it might feel as though, you know, people on the streets, ah, they'll be all right now. It's summer. And actually Things couldn't be further from the truth. The charity that Peter, Phil and I are fundraising for this year, Centerpoint, deals with a whole range of people facing a whole range of issues to do with homelessness. Some are in a precarious home situation where they may imminently be about to become homeless. Some are couch surfing and have no permanent place of residence. Some are in and out of shelters and are seeking permanent employment. But the consistent trend with all of them is that they really need an arm putting around them uh, and a friend to point them in the right direction and start to put one foot in front of another in a positive direction and start to get their lives back on track. And you would truly be horrified at the amount of people in this country that are facing horrendous scenarios at home with domestic abuse and unloving families that can't afford the rent, they can't afford the heating. And all they are looking for in life is a little bit of help. And that's what Chan, that is what our charity Centerpoint does. Puts an arm around these people and it helps them to get back on track in life. Now, all of us listening here today, some of us have got large portfolios, some of us have, have got small portfolios, some of us have got no portfolios at all, but just enjoy the show. But all of us could afford to spend just a few pounds donating to support a cause that helps people that really have got nowhere left to go. And I would really, truly encourage all of you that are listening to this show, that have listened to previous shows, and that will listen to future shows, stick your hands in your pockets and just donate a few pounds to a really good cause, because there are an awful lot of people out there that are going to need help all year round. And just because it's not freezing cold and dark all the time doesn't mean that they're not there. 
and doesn't mean that they don't need help. So Peter, Phil and I this year are raising money for Centrepoint UK. You can find the link um, online if you go to www.justgiving.com forward slash page forward slash twin Pete's challenge 24. That's justgiving.com forward slash page forward slash twin Pete's challenge 24. All donations are very gratefully received. Um, thank you very much. Thank you for those words, Henry. Um, really resonate with me that um, we're still doing stuff in and around Leicester regarding all, all of those things. And you're absolutely spot on. It doesn't get any better in in the uh, in in the, in, the, in the summer or, or the spring or when weather seems to be you know it's not you know no ice and frost out there it's just as bad and um the the difficulty we've got now um is a lot of councils are being told that they their budgets are being cut come april so they've even got even less money to support the homeless and those affected by temporary homelessness or currently lots of them are in permanent um, situations of homelessness and um, I, I've used up their the goodwill of individuals, you know, so are no longer even able to sofa surf. So anything we can do to support homeless charities, um, including Centrepoint, um, will be gratefully received. So thank you for that, Henry. And we'll, um, if you can make a donation, um, please, please, please do so. Um, thank you ever so much. Phil, you've got one last doc and then we're going to call it a day, mate. Do you want to keep this one short and sweet? Um, oh. I'll, I, you know, hopefully it's one that's profitable and not a dud. Um, and we can have, and we can have some unity. See what I did there? Yeah, I'll keep it brief. Um, <laughs> this we, one is we can be positive it, about it. That's what I meant, Henry. Come on. This one, this one is profitable, very profitable, but it is a dog. It's oh. another dog, and um, it is, it's a big dog. It's uh, it's British American tobacco, and um, this is a. Uh, I mean, I totally get, totally get why people just turn off now and say I'm not not touching tobacco shares. I get that. Um, yeah. Governments are making it more and more difficult to sell not only tobacco but also vapes, um, and it's. Um, it's a very, very hard business to be in. And, and it's been getting harder. But these businesses are tremendously resilient because they're selling selling products that people keep coming back in, uh, and buying. And, um, you know, I think it's important to be open-minded about these things, whether you, whether, whether you, uh, whether the three of us would, uh, by this is by the by it's uh it's about just looking at situations in the stock market and uh and discussing them and what what's very interesting to me is that uh you know we talked about your uh, uh stocks without forecast momentum this this has been a stock with terrible forecast momentum but there's a sign that that the downward trend may have bottomed and things maybe start to be looking up. It's had a terrible time the last couple of years, uh, particularly in America, uh, consumers trading down from its premium brands of cigarettes to cheaper brands. There's been a lot of problem with illegal vaping and so on. Uh, and profit profit forecasts have come down. Having said that, this is this is a company that still has profit margins of about 45% um generates lots of cash flow um it's still very much in business it is developing its what it's called its new generational products so the vaping and, and the like and there is some underlying potential some underlying growth in this business not much but some so this business is far from dead and it trades on six just under six and a half times earnings with a dividend yield of 10 percent that dividend is expected to grow by about four percent a year for the next three years earnings a little bit below that but still some growth 
and the company has just sold out of a stake, uh, sort of some of a stake in, a, in an Indian company that it owned, and it's using the proceeds to buy back shares. It's buying back about one point six billion pounds worth of shares, which is about I don't know five five percent or no about three percent of the market capitalization. And you know, buying back these shares at ten percent is just for sort the of ten percent dividend yield. It's a no-brainer because it actually, in, never mind enhancing earnings, it enhances cash flow. And if you look at look at the valuation of this, and you know, Imperial Tobacco, which is on an even lower rating, and again, that has forecast earnings growth and dividend growth. Um, these shares look look incredibly cheap. You know. If you look across the Atlantic, Altria is on eight and a half times earnings. And Philip Morris, which is by far the sort of star performer in this sector, is on 14 times earnings. And there has been, you know, pressure by activist investors in British American tobacco to take the listing to New York away from London. It's not going to do that, by the way, but you can see why. I mean, I mean, that's the case. You could take the old FTSE and list it on New York, couldn't you, on that basis? But what I'm saying is that this, I mean, this, you could have made this argument for the last goodness knows how many years, and the shares have been horrible. Even with a high yield, you've still actually lost money because the share price has declined faster than, than the yield. But you just wonder that whether there comes a time when uh this this will end and um sentiment towards this company is just absolutely dire and you just you just wonder you know it's not going bust or anything like that that you know is is this a company that can recover because because the expectations baked into the share price are just nothing hmm it's, it's it is one of those Phil. It's, it's 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 obviously been one of those companies that you know the the likes of uh, Woodford, um, the old Woodford back in the day, Anthony Bolton back in the day, all made lots of money on you know compounding the the um the total returns on that on those particular stocks, but they've not really gone anywhere for for some time. Um, but sitting in a ten percent yield with a buyback, Ooh. it's. It looks like something that you would you, you would hold instead of sitting, you know, sitting with the cash sitting on your on your portfolio, you know, buy that and and trade around the the ranges potentially, and if they can get around all this noise around youth vaping and and potential tax that some people are saying could be positive for them or negative for them, it's one of them that doesn't need you need to do a lot. To give you some returns um but the question i would ask you is what would be the catalyst for something to to be better than just a steady return and the dividend can you see a catalyst that could actually sorry for the using the word ignite the share price uh, not really i mean you know you know usually you think like you know the catalyst is like something like a takeover or private equity but this 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 is still got like, you know stock market value of 53 billion it's, yeah there's not many buyers out there yeah it's a massive yeah. company still still a massive company um i i, I don't know i mean mm. if i if i'm this company i'm probably you know given that given that the yield is not really propping up the share price. You, you know, you'd be almost better off cancelling the dividend completely and just using the cash flow to buy the shares back. Instead of paying it out as a dividend, use it to just buy the shares, shrink the shares, mm. because at this price, it's just a no-brainer. Yeah, it's a good, it's, yeah, 10% yield, steady, not loss-making, profitable still. Yeah, and, and all these emerging markets, people are still smoking. You know the the number of smokers is, is going up, not down. It's only across Europe and US and and UK that uh, smoking numbers are going down, but uh, vaping levels are going up. So it's an interesting one. It's I've a never hard smoked. So I, can, I think the yeah, problem you're going to have is, is probably 
Go sorry, on, the sorry. problem you're going to have is probably my generation, and I'm probably going to set an awful lot of people off here with what I'm about to say, but there is no valuation in the world that would convince me to buy this company. Absolutely none. It produces no social good whatsoever. Tobacco is an evil product. Um, I think smoking is dreadful. It causes tremendous societal damage. Uh, and I think an awful lot of people my age look at it the same way. I might be wrong in that. Um, and I don't necessarily think it's an age problem. And, you know, by the same argument, do you then stay away from alcohol stocks or gambling stocks or weapons stocks? Or there's a whole host of ethical drivers. But to me, it just genuinely is untouchable because of what it produces. Um you do wonder. And I also, I think fund managers, you know, if you take me as a retail investor, I represent, what, a quarter of the market, probably, if that, as a retail investor, I suspect that the majority of the market is made up of institutions. But institutional fund managers are going to be coming under increasing amounts of pressure to have an ESG policy. And an ESG policy sort of precludes you from having things like oil and gas and tobacco and, you know, as individuals, it doesn't necessarily matter whether we think that those things are ethical or not. That's not what I'm getting at. It's more, you know, if we just take it as a situational thing, if the funds can't, if I won't invest and the funds won't invest, who is going to invest? If it's too big to buy, you know, is this just continuing going to slowly trickling? Some institutions have been in bats for, 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 for decades, Henry, and they're not going to be selling. Because they want security of, of a company that's no, I'm going to I, use this the wrong way. A company that's not going to go out of business overnight. They've been around. I don't disagree with that. I mean, somebody must own these shares, but they've held oh, it yeah. on a gradually declining PE, on a gradually declining share price. You know, this is not a business that's that's screaming healthy buy and hold. No, no. Sorry, Phil, you were gonna say, go on. I I I agree with a lot of what Henry said. And that's why mm. it's so fascinating. You know, because I I do think this has been, you know, a very easy stock to become a victim of an, an ESG agenda. But it's interesting. Just looking at the shareholder list, the largest uh, the largest um, shareholder is Capital, who are you know have a reputation for being pretty shrewd shrewd managers, shrewd shrewd fund managers, and. Uh, I do wonder whether whether this will become some kind of you know you'll see increased activism here. You've had stirring with it, and uh, that's not means you know the share price. This could be dead money, yeah. But it also if if, if an activist comes and gets involved, and uh, you know starts playing around with the strategy, you know again you know. Cancel the dividend because obviously people people that obviously hasn't attract and use it to re you know repurchase the shares shrink the shares grow the earnings per share. I think you'd see the share price go up. Um, you know it's a difficult one. It's a, it's a contra very controversial company, but you know there'll be listeners to this podcast who are you know maybe looking for off the wall ideas. Um, you know, it's 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 high risk to an extent, but it's you know, but you know, a lot of that risk is surely reflected in in the price. But it's one one to just watch, I think, because I think you can, I think we can learn a lot as investors by looking at situations like this. Uh, it's not just whether you would buy the shares; it's just it's just a fascinating case study of what happens to businesses at a certain stage in their lives facing a lot of headwinds. Um, so that's the reason why I brought it up today. An interesting mm -hmm. point, Thank Phil. You. I like that. You know, you don't have to have a position to watch and watch and learn. Absolutely. No, th thank you for that, mate. Um, very, very interesting stocks there. Um, I just want to say, um, ladies and gents, thank you all for your feedback from the last pod. Um, if you've enjoyed this podcast, please share it on twitter slash x and across social media let us know your feedback um if you want to carry on kicking me whilst i'm down tell us what your thoughts were on unity but please tell us about what your thoughts are about phil's picks and also henry's pick as well and please 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 um keep in touch with us on youtube 
um subscribe on youtube if you haven't done so already and keep keep sharing the feedback and get in touch with me regarding the prizes you prize winners um regarding your books and subscription to to share scope and um keep subscribing to phil's um sub stack which is at investing stuff and please also i keep I keep forgetting to say this henry tell the ladies and gents about your blog where it is where to find it uh, oh, also blimey. because henry occasionally writes um articles he's busy he's a young man he's got a young wife he hasn't got time to be writing stuff every week like phil has you know so, so tell us about I, where you I, find your I stuff. do also have a blog yeah, I do also have a blog. I don't write as regularly as Phil. I usually publish once or twice a month. And you can find me at theethicalentrepreneur.com. Um, I've got a, Oh, that's a why you don't with... like tobacco. But you like well, your drink, you don't go. you, mate? Hey. I, I'm, I'm yeah, just waiting yeah. for the rocks to come flying in, to be honest, with everyone telling me <laughs> why All I'm the anti-smokers coming, just... well, smokers coming to your blog. Sorry, I interrupted you. So tell them where to find the blog. Sorry yeah. again, please. It is. Uh, it's the ethicalentrepreneur.com. Um, you can subscribe to keep up to date with my postings. When I do post, it's usually every two weeks. I've got a section on there for beginners. So new articles for uh, investors that are new to the stock market. Um, and I've also got the blog categorized by section. So if you're particularly interested in quality or income or risk management, you can go and see my articles on those topics as well. So that's the ethicalentrepreneur.com. Brilliant. And Phil, one more plug for investing stuff. Where do they find it? What's the URL? Investingstuff.substack. Simple as that, folks. <laughs> okay, ladies and gents, that is a wrap. That is podcast one, two, four, over. Thank you for listening to Twin Peaks Investing Podcast. That's the end of and it's the first one for this quarter, date 3rd of April. Thank you for listening. Look forward to hearing your feedback. Thank you for your continued support. Take care. God bless you all. And for those that are still on Easter break, enjoy. Bye-bye. This Twin Peaks Investing Podcast is brought to you in association with SharePad from ShareScoop the UK's number one investment data and analysis software for private investors and traders. Visit sharescope.co.uk and discover the advantage. Mm -hmm.